Guy and Dr. Macaranes for the presentation. Um, the presentations earlier actually was a, was a delight for me because I really like looking at development stories of how countries have developed. Of course, the Chinese development story is clearly one that most, if not all of us, have studied. Uh, the Philippine development story is also pretty interesting. Uh, Professor Macaranes yesterday attended one of our Wally Center's forums. And yesterday, it was a forum on shared prosperity. He invited me to share some of the, uh, uh, the findings that we have from that forum. And I think that's pretty relevant because if two countries are to help each other in co-development, we have to better understand each other's own development stories and development problems. Uh, I think earlier it was uh, well presented to us of how China is you know, entering a new normal, uh, a shift, if you want, the economic paradigm. And the Philippines, in, in many respects, is also entering a new economic paradigm. Uh, we're calling it an economic renaissance in our part. Um, if China is in this period where it is rebalancing its growth from investments to consumption, we are in that stage where we are trying to rebalance in the opposite direction. Uh, but I would like to echo what uh, Dr. Thomas was saying a while ago of the, this whole matter of inclusive growth. And oftentimes this is a perspective which we do not focus on enough, I think, in discussions like this. So uh, in this presentation, I am going to be giving uh, a little bit more uh, thought or insight as to the current situation in the Philippines and how prosperity that we have been gaining in the past few uh, years, in fact, some of us in the Philippines have been proud of saying that we are second fastest in China, right, in terms of growth, because China's growth, yeah, yeah, growth rate, right, growth rate, um, particularly because China's growth rate has declined, of course, but, uh, but what does that mean when we speak of jobs, employment, and income opportunities? So I'm going to give the Philippine story, and I think you can see some echoing. And later on, towards the end of the presentation, I think I will be able to present a few challenges to the Philippine growth story and our shared prosperity story, where I think immediately some of us can find opportunities of where Chinese Philippine bilateral um, uh, uh, or mutual uh, cooperation can come. Uh, so as you may know, the Philippines is growing spectacularly for our standards of about 6.2-6.3% uh, in the last 5-6 years. Uh, comparing that to previous uh, decades, which is around 5%, that's a huge jump. Right? Uh, and with FDI having increased sixfold since 2010, we are very optimistic. And government itself is very optimistic that they said, okay, why don't we now start planning ahead, finally, and start planning ahead as to what is our Filipino dream? Uh, the Filipino dream is that we become a middle-income country by 2014, and this is embodied in the uh, development plan or the program that the uh, National Economic and Development Authority had set uh, last year called Ambition 2040. Uh, and in this program, essentially, which is based on a survey of about 10,000 households over the Philippines, uh, the net had set forth, okay, what are the things that Filipinos want to achieve 25 years from now? And coming from that, what do we have to do as, uh, uh, as a government to help Filipinos reach that dream? And the dream is actually something which I believe is quite universal. Uh, every Filipino dreams of a medium-sized, although I'm not quite sure yet the definition of a medium-sized, home is. Every Filipino dreams of that, a medium-sized uh, home. Oh, sorry. Children who have been educated in college and their own car. 70% of respondents said they wanted to drive their own car. That was their dream. That was what they wanted to see themselves owning and being 25 years ago. Uh, Neta did their calculations, and according to the calculations, in current prices, uh, a Filipino household has to earn somewhere in the ballpark of $2,500 a month, gross. In the Philippine, the Philippine pesos, that's about 120,000 pesos a month. Now that's a total dream because if you look at the current figures, only about 1.5% of Philippine households earn that much on a monthly basis. Which means that whatever prosperity gains we have had in the last six or so years, it's not enough. In fact, they say we have to grow at an even greater rate of 7% for 25 years straight for that dream to happen. Uh, shared prosperity 
intrusive growth, but I think it's a more uh, appropriate term, is something now which we have to start worrying about. Because prosperity gains, these seem to come quick if you're looking at GDP figures and GDP growth figures. But whether this growth trickles down, or more importantly, in fact, rather than trickling down, we, we are more interested in growth where it's inclusive so that you don't have a wealth redistribution that comes after the fact, but growth across all sectors when and as growth actually happens. It's something that we have to start thinking about in the Philippine case. And I think China has a lot of experience to tell us what to do or what not to do. Uh, in this case. Uh, just so that we have a better understanding of where the Philippines is coming from, our growth in the last uh, several years has been primarily driven by services sector growth. This is the most important sector in terms of GDP share. Uh, more than 50% of, 58% uh, of uh, GDP growth has come from this. Um, and in particular, the services sector, the IT, BPM, IDPO and tourism sectors were primary job creators. Uh, this is where a lot of the productivity gains have come in in terms of the services sector. The thing is, and one of our worries is that in the services sector, which is our primary growth sector, productivity has actually not increased as much as we want. In fact, it is still some of the lowest when you compare it across different countries. Right? Um, and in that case, we have the same problem of how to increase value added. Right? The economy of the Philippines is largely consumption driven. So it's, it's the complete opposite of what China is concerned with that from an investment driven economy moving to a consumption driven economy, we are a consumption driven economy wanting of investment. <laughs> One thing, however, that makes the Philippine economy quite unique is the fact that we have a whole lot of OFW remittances which help boy the Philippine economy, defending us from external shock. Now, uh, just because I just have five minutes, um, a quick assessment of the level of shared prosperity in the Philippines, just so you know what our current problem is, is that you know, if, if prosperity is to be gainful, we, this has to translate to rising living standards for all people. And at the policy center, we said that, you know, just keep it basic. These are three basic indicators of, of shared prosperity in the Philippines. And we playfully put together the acronym PIE, the proverbial <laughs> economic PIE. These indicators are poverty, poverty incidence, reduction in poverty, um, income, and we're talking about the quality of that income, and the employment, the quality of that employment. And as many of you have guessed, the Philippines continues to face problems in terms of poverty. One in five Filipino households are poor. One in four Filipino individuals are poor. And in fact, although officially, only one out of five Filipino households are poor. Half of Filipino households feel they are poor based on self rated poverty. And that boggles the minds of many of us of why people feel poor even if you say they're not poor. And of course, you can talk about the psychology of people, but I think one of the one of the more important reasons is that four out of ten Filipinos live in what they call cyclical poverty. They're transient poor, meaning one time you look at the records and the statistics, they're poor, the next time they're not, the next time they are again. Which means people move, slip in and out of poverty, which means they're highly vulnerable. And what makes them even more so highly vulnerable is that when you are out of poverty, you are no longer eligible for additional cash transfer program and other special programs for the government. But that makes you especially vulnerable because whether it's job loss, disease, illness, climate change, flooding, right? When these attack, then you become poor again. In terms of income, income has been rising, but one major concern we have is that unlike in China, wages have actually been declining in real terms in the Philippines. Uh, in fact, I'll be showing you that, uh, that slide. Um, and what is actually also disturbing is that in some of our growth sectors, in particular in trade, wages for among sales workers have actually declined the most about 1% of the year, which kind of reflects now problems with regards to increasing productivity. Uh, in terms of uh, wealth redistribution, let me just show this slide. Um, kudos to the previous administration, there actually is, there has been a rise in the income share of the bottom deciles. But because of the huge disparity between the top 30% and the bottom, it's not enough. And what also is disturbing is that there's actually a loss in the income share of the top percent, uh, which is, of course, perhaps just the global slowdown. Uh, now, let me just go quickly now to the 
challenges to share to Spain and the Philippines. Right? These are the opportunities that might come in mean, for collaboration. Um, clearly, one of the challenges for shared prosperity is we have to continue the macroeconomic gains we have. Whether you believe in trickle down economics or not, the last six years of achievement is not enough to have actually led the growth across all sectors. So, whatever we do, we have to keep whatever we're doing that's good for the economy, macroeconomic stability, uh, fiscal health, etc. But another clear challenge is how to address transitional poverty and the people who slip in and out of poverty because of external shocks. And might this become might this be possible through better infrastructure, post harvest facilities, so that the farmers don't have to uh, be directly affected by weather conditions? Uh, does this mean social protection? Does this mean increasing value added so that they are in better uh, positions and jobs? Which of course translates to increased labor productivity and, and as I just said, foster higher value added sectors. Services is our major driver of growth. But of course, the key question is what kind of services are Filipinos employed in? Um, and they tend to be employed in highly vulnerable, rather low value added sectors, save for a few such industries like the IT sector. Um, and then, of course, the question is how to serve the untapped bottom, large bottom, if you want, of the pyramid. Um, we want to do this correctly. We want to grow the right way since we've been delayed for quite a few decades. Um, and this is a very great opportunity for China and the Philippines to help each other out, not just in figuring out things conceptually, but even in the, the actual economic transactions. Because some of the things that China have, that's what we need. And some of the things that we actually are good at, that's what China can actually do.